women in leadership, both at board level and at management in the banking sector. And typically, the banking sector is a bit more regulated than other sectors that you would find. And in Ghana, the statistics is not very different. We have about 29% female representation on the boards of the 25 Ghanaian banks. And interestingly, we only have two female MDs. So why is PwC doing this and why are we doing it now? So PwC has an inclusion first strategy where we seek to ensure that there's diversity and inclusion, not only gender diversity, we seek to promote it, not only within the firm and outside of the firm. And the reason being that inclusion brings different perspectives to the leadership table, it brings innovation, and it helps to ensure that different voices are heard and better decisions are made. So we look forward to a very engaging, interactive session where we bring all our views to the table. You see the findings of the survey that has been conducted over a four-month period. Thank you very much and welcome. Jage. Thank you very much, Clara. So changing currency, examining trends and challenges of female participation in Ghana's banking sector. So a lot of what we are going to discuss perhaps is triggered by conversations that were had with persons within the banking sector of Ghana. But I'm sure that the conversations extend well beyond the banking sector. And that is why we are all here today. So to give us um, some uh, idea about what went into the report and how these conversations were recorded, I'd like to introduce Andrea Opokudramna. Andrea is a manager who works on special tax within the tax reporting and strategy team in PwC Ghana. She does very well at qualitative research and report writing and brings us different perspectives to our business. She will, you, you will find that in all of these as well, she is a good presenter and she has been involved in conducting the research. I think of it as qualitative research unless she disagrees with me. And putting together, together with her team, all the findings that she wants to share with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Andrea Opoku Jamna. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and welcome to the launch of the Changing Currency Breakfast Forum, our report, where we're examining the trends and challenges of female participation in Ghana's banking sector. So how did this report came about? Well, it was a day in September of 2023 where a conversation was had between some women, a man, another woman, and a few more men about what we do to support the industries in which we serve. And diversity, as Clara mentioned, is something very important to us within our firm. So that's how we came up with the report, Changing Currency. So I'm just going to talk about um, the report findings and we'll take it from there. All right, so about the change in currency report. So I had the pleasure of speaking to 26 people, 26, over the course of approximately 14 weeks. And out of those 26, it were not all women. There were some men that I spoke to as well. And it was very interesting conversation. 
I'm somebody who likes talking, but I was all talked out afterwards. And it's amazing how comfortable people feel when they're not in their environments and they can speak about some of the things that they are going through. So we spent about 24.5 hours talking. That's, I just thought about it, that's a whole day and a little bit change, talking about the things that are really important. So we were looking at senior management within the banking sector. Um, so typically, as mentioned, senior management, we speak with C-suites, executive directors as well, and it was very, very engaging conversation. And as I mentioned, I spoke to some men as well, because we couldn't have a diversity publication in the banking sector without speaking to men. I spoke to board members, some of them are here today and have the pleasure of hearing their perspectives as well. So what were some of the key findings? Okay, so these are the three key findings that came up from the report. Firstly, a lot of the female executives believe that banks regard diversity and inclusion as a checkbox exercise. It was a couple of years ago that the term DNI, IND, DEI came back, and a lot of women felt that, well, people are just doing it as mere lip services. And they felt that perhaps in their banks, yeah, it matters, but not to the extent to which they thought it did. And they didn't really look at the pivotal role that it does to strengthen organizational resilience. So that was our first observation. Secondly, work-life integration. Some call it work-life balance, but you get the gist. So work, having a healthy work-life integration affects women across all levels within the bank, banking hierarchies, but it's particularly pronounced at the upper echelons where female representation is scarce and the stakes are elevated. You will be amazed to hear about some of the stories that the female executives shared with me of things they had to do to make sure that they juggled everything correctly. And last but no means least, many of the participants felt that there is a lot of knowledge in the sector and it would be beneficial to have collaboration with women across the industry where they can share ideas, transfer knowledge, network, and so on. So let's look at the landscape, currently what it is. Okay, so across all the 23 banks in Ghana, there are 218 members in board members, of which 154 are male and 64 are female, giving percentages of 29.4% female board members. And within management teams, um, there are 245 members, of which 66 are female. So you can see that the representation is quite low. But I'll go on to say that this actually mirrors what is happening across the global banking sector, whether it be the UK, whether it be in the US, other European countries. There's generally very few females at high levels within banking organizations around the world. So it's not just Ghana, it's just how things are unfortunately. And that's one of the things we're here today to discuss, to see what we can change. Okay. So when we look at um, female representation in bank leadership in Africa, this is just a few of the countries that we looked at. So across Ghana, you see we've got two MDs. Nigeria does particularly well um, with the 10 MDs. Kenya, three out of the MDs are 42 um, of banks. Kenya, only two of actually, well, there are 13, there are actually 17 commercial banks. Um, 13 that had um, a lot of representation in the report that I looked. And in Rwanda, there are 17, seven MDs and 17 banks. So you can see Rwanda and Nigeria, they really have taken a change to push female leadership to the tops. And I, because we're having this conversation, I don't think that it just ends here. I think there's a lot more that can be done. So that's just looking at comparative analysis. Okay, so when we did the report, we did it into a lot of sections. So we're going to talk now about confronting internal barriers. So you're probably wondering, what does that mean? Okay. Okay. 
So when we talk about confronting internal barriers, we're talking about the things that people have in themselves that limits them from moving forward to the next level, okay? So when we interviewed the female executives, 80% identified imposter syndrome and a lack of confidence as one of the main barriers that pushes women from excelling and attaining roles, okay? So what is imposter syndrome? It is a psychological pattern where individuals doubt their accomplishment. And what's interesting is that even during um, the survey, when I spoke to some of the female executives and they spoke about their own particular journeys, many of them mentioned that they were offered a position, but they themselves did not think they were ready. Even though they had been identified as candidates that were suitable for the position, they did not think they were ready. So they themselves had exhibited imposter syndrome, okay? And it, it's, not, it's not exclusive to women. It happens to men, it happens to men, it's, it's a human issue. But because of women have so many things that are on their mind, the things that they have attend to, they generally have a lot of imposter syndrome, especially when it comes to pushing themselves, okay? So how does imposter syndrome manifest itself? It does so in three ways. Firstly, procrastination. Okay, so I'll use myself as an example just to give you some context. I have to pre prepare the change in currency report. I think it's just okay. Clara and Vish think it's really good, but I'm overthinking. And as I'm thinking, time is going, time is going, time is going, because I'm procrastinating, because I'm not really sure what I am doing is actually good. I'm not sure that what I'm doing is cutting it. And that is what a lot of women that the female executives feel happen within the banking sector, and not only in the banking sector, across many industries and across the road. Secondly is perfectionism. That is, I can't be seen to court lacking. I have to bring my very best self. But then I doubt myself, and so I don't know what my best self is. So I'm be trying to be overly perfect and not leaving room for any mistakes when we all know that mistakes are what help us grow. So that's how another way it manifests itself. Thirdly, it's avoidance. There's gonna to be too many people at the Changing Currency Forum. I can't stand up and speak to them. I'm not going to go at all, because if I go, I'm going to be exposed as a fraud, so I am not going to do it. So there's a lot of avoidance, especially in high stakes situations, okay? And then if you look at it, when you take males, for instance, and this is what the female executive said, that a man could see a job posting and have 40% of what is required for him to even be successful at getting a call back, only 40% but he'll go for it and he'll kind of elevate the 40% to make it look like it's 60%. A woman will have maybe 55% of what is required to succeed in that role and they'll think, oh, it's only 55%. I will focus on the 45, that's what they're gonna ask me about, I'm not going for it. So those are some of the things how imposter syndrome manifests itself. Okay, so what accounts for the confidence gap and imposter syndrome? Firstly, societal expectations. We all live here in Ghana and we know the deal. There's a lot of societal expectations of women. And although it's changing, some of them still remain. You're a woman, why do you want to stay and work late? What about the husband? What will your children eat? Oh, how is your husband gonna talk about why his wife is not in the house? So what that does then is from a young age, many women are raised to believe that, number one, you don't talk to boys in school or university, you do your books. But when you leave university, where's your husband? So you're not married and all those things. So there's so many things that women think about and this also leads to the um, imposter syndrome. Secondly, it feeds into the first where it talks about gender stereotypes. Again, do I want to be seen as a high-flying woman or do I want to see as a woman who takes care of the home? 
Yes, and also a woman, you're supposed to be quiet, you're supposed to be agreeable, you're supposed to be a little bit timid. Why would you then go into a boardroom to fight with men? So there's the gender stereotypes that come also from men onto women. That helps women to feel like they're not ready. Then there's the family objections. Everybody who, here who knows that whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, when you have family support, it really helps you in propelling in your careers and everything you do. A lack of a family support, whether it be for a man or a woman, can be very detrimental to careers and how they grow. And so imagine that you're a woman and you've decided that you want to go enter into a high pressurized industry such as banking, but your family are not supporting it or they're objecting. How will you grow? And lastly is underrepresentation. If a lot of women or some women, they don't see other women that they can aspire to, they will feel that they will not be the ones to step into the role and be that first person to do it. They will rather see somebody that has done it before and therefore they, they can see that it can be done. So when there's a general unrepresentation in a specific industry of women, some women may question whether attaining a certain position is actually possible. So these are some of the things that um, contribute to imposter syndrome and how it manifests itself. Next, we're going to amplifying impact. So with amplifying impact, we're talking about the significance of female representation within the industry and how it helps women to achieve. So in the survey, 45% of the female executives acknowledged the crucial role that female leaders or mentors played in shaping their careers and their trajectories. So some of these women they work with directly, some of these women were actually in the industry itself, but they were able to tap into their knowledge, their networks and their support. And they spoke about how it really helped them to speak to somebody who had done it before. So, but on the other end of the scale, there are several women who express a lack of support from women in the sector. And this is a very dicey one because when I spoke to the women who felt that they didn't get support, there was number one, a lack of representation was there. And number two, a lot of personality and lifestyle differences. Now, you will agree that the banking sector, for it to be male dominated, for a woman to stand out, she has to exhibit certain qualities. Right? And some of these qualities that these women exhibit, other women may not. And in doing so, what it does, it sets them apart from the women. So if a woman is seen to be aggressive, a woman seen to be argumentative, or a woman says, just doesn't say good morning in the morning to another woman, some females feel that that person, she's, she doesn't want to get close to me, I don't want to get close to her, she could be rude. And what that does, it, um, it contributes to gender disparity in the workplace. Because when two women are in the workplace, some men dismiss it as female dynamics and they want to step away because they don't want to get involved and it's a woman issue. And that is quite problematic because women need to support each other as they move forward in their careers, not only in banking but other places. So next, we're going to look at nurturing potential. So when we look at nurturing potential, what do we mean by this? So nurturing potential is what we do to what are banks doing to support women in their careers to attain leadership positions? What training are they offering them to make them to be comfortable, more confident, to increase their knowledge? So out of the 13 banks that were surveyed, at least 85% of the banks had female talent or mentorship programs. Um, some of them were more established than others, some were just taking off, and with other banks it had not really gone past just conversations and lots of meetings. But out of the banks that did 
um, have good programs. I'll say about three of them had well-established programs and they were well recognized in the market for their commitment to female empowerment. So you could ask some, and I spoke to some university students, young women, where they spoke about certain banks that, oh, I want to open an account there because I saw they did a women's program and it was on the internet and I really enjoyed looking at it. It looks like they support women. So the, pe the banks with the established programs, their, represent um, their reputations preceded them in the industry, okay? Again, like the point I mentioned before, several of the female executives stated that they, many of the women that they worked with felt that diversity inclusion was just lip service. So it wasn't actually something that banks were taking seriously. So even when, and that has a two kind of sided issue. So therefore, if the main target audience do not believe that the bank are taking DNI seriously and it's just a lip service, then they don't put themselves forward because they don't think anything's going to manifest. Then how can the bank then have the program? So you see there's an issue with how people see the banks and how the banks can conduct themselves. So many of the female executives reported that they have been approached to serve as mentors, not just to women, but also men in across the industry because they were recognized as people that could give good advice that had very good life stories excellent careers and they were someone that both men and women seeked out to mentor them but for some of the executives due to the male-dominated nature of the industry they focused and prioritized mentoring women exclusively because they felt that there was the gap and you see there's a link between women who have been mentored and those that mentor. So there's, it's two-sided. Women who have been mentored and see the benefits of mentoring often want to mentor others. Some women who weren't mentored and wish they were mentored want to mentor others. And then there are the women that weren't mentored and then thought, well, what can I offer because I don't know anything about mentoring and I wasn't mentored and they shy away. So that is quite problematic. And lastly, as mentioned, there's a collective effort, there's a collective yeah, aspiration for the survey executives for broader networking opportunities and learning knowledge transfer within the industry. Okay, so the major one, and the major one is the Balancing Act. Okay? So, when I spoke to the female executives, every single one of them spoke about work-life integration, work-life balance, the things they felt they had to do to be recognized at the bank, to, to be put forward for other positions. And they felt that the expectations upon them was much higher than their expectations placed on their male counterparts. And they often felt the need to exert additional effort and make up for lost time. Like if something happens and they have to go home to attend to a family matter, then sacrificing time with family to do work things because they felt that they had let the team down or they were going to be negatively impacted when it came to appraisal time for taking time off. And I asked a male, um, a senior male executive, what he thought. And he said, in his opinion, his opinion, let me just put that out there, that he felt that many women sometimes underestimate what is actually needed um, for them to excel in the industry. And then sometimes when the stakes are really high, they find, he finds that they try and overcompensate themselves and they burden themselves with doing too much. But the fact of the matter is, there is low representation of them and they have to stand out in their minds in order to excel. Okay, so the matter of work-life integration is very complex because everybody has different unique needs. Um, and there are some banks that acknowledge that there are specific issues that women go through that affect their performance and work-life integration, so they go about addressing them. And they are as follows. 
Firstly, mental health. So a lot of banks have mental health programs, counseling service, and confidential access for people to discuss, not just women, the, any mental health, any problems, any issues that they are facing. Secondly, marital and family dynamics. Again, everybody has different and unique needs. So many of the banks were implementing policies to accommodate family responsibilities, such as flexible leave arrangements, especially as times have changed now and a lot of families are separated in the sense that somebody may live in another country and so they would have to then, you know, a wife or a husband will have to then go and visit his family abroad. These are all things that come with flexible leave and the things that come along with that. Thirdly, fertility concerns. Now this was seen as a major issue in, with a lot of the female executives because it's something that is unspoken. So if somebody is going through an issue, it's not something that is openly discussed. And so they hold those things in. And what that does is that it manifests itself in its way through work, um, interactions, um, just having someone's general mood. So they have special consideration and discretionary leave, not just for women, but also men, um, for employees undergoing fertility investigations or women having pre or postnatal issues. And lastly, financial independence. Now this is workshops and training specifically directed for women, female employees, for them to understand what they need to do in order to look after their money. And one of the executives I spoke to said that one of um, her female employees had a very, very tragic case. Her husband passed away and she knew nothing. She knew nothing about the bills were paid. She didn't know if there was a mortgage on the house. She didn't know, she didn't know anything. She was totally blind. And after um, the funeral and her time off and she came to work, they noticed that this woman had lost weight. And when they asked her how much weight she lost, they, she said them 32 kilograms due to stress because she didn't know how she was going to keep her family together. She didn't even know how much um, the fees were paid for her children's school or how she went about it and how she was going to cope. And that's in that bank, that is when they decided that they must do training for women to see how they can help them when life happens because life does happen to all of us in different ways, shapes and forms. Okay, so cultivating supportive environments. Banks have a duty of care. Banks have a duty of care to provide environments where staff can thrive and grow. And this extends beyond legal and regulatory requirements. There's ethics involved as well. So we can't speak about this without speaking about the elephant in the room, and that is sexual harassment. So sexual harassment has cast a black cloud over the banking industry. And there's things that we know, things that are unspoken about. And one thing that is for sure is that everybody, regardless of gender, needs to feel safe and supported in their workplace. Um, as they will more likely excel and contribute their perspectives to, and grow into leadership position. So again, I asked the male, senior male executive, what, what he feels um, contributed to sexual harassment within the industry. And he said, in his opinion, there's a lot of individual discretion within the sector. And individual discretion coupled with wielding power causes a problem. And a lot of people who are not only sexual harassment or it comes to instances of bullying, you will find that they are younger people. They're the younger men who have the older male counterparts who get bullied into doing the work that the men don't want to do. It's the young women that are put into positions to win new businesses for the banks that are told maybe wear something a little bit short or oh, go on, smile with him. 
everyone knows a smile sometimes can invite other things as well. And so with that being said, there were so many preventative measures that I spoke to the banks about, and these are some of them that they have in place. They have policies, they have code of ethics, they have training and education, unconscious bias and workplace conduct, reporting channels, whistleblowing, and disciplinary action. Now the issue is so many of these things are in place, but it's not widely circulated. So, so when people come and are onboarded, they may not exactly know where to get this information, and that's the problem. So there's one thing about something like this existing, and another thing about it being well known. Those are two different things. So just because you have a policy in place, it doesn't mean everyone knows about it. So what's the point of having the policy? So these are some of the issues that come around, and these are some of the measures that have been taken by the surveyed banks. Okay, so my favorite is allies in action. As I mentioned, we wouldn't be here to talk about diversity in a male-dominated industry without talking about men. So, interestingly, and it was actually of no surprise, a lot of the females executives spoke about the pivotal roles and the amount of support they got from their male leaders, their bosses, to help them attain the positions that they have. And a lot of the women, sometimes these males executives, were at the start of their careers, and now they're at executive director level, they're at the C-suite, they're even a managing director, and they can still remember the man that gave them the stepping stone to get to where they are today. So it's really important for men, it's also by virtue of the fact that the men are the dominant gender in the industry. So it was really important for men to offer encouragement and for them to challenge the women that they see have the qualities to be in leadership positions, to step out of their comfort zones. This also helps to eradicate imposter syndrome because the women that spoke about having the men in their corner were very assertive, they were very confident, they were very, they, they took issues head on and they weren't afraid and they spoke about the way men had helped them to get to where they are. So it's very important to talk about diversity and men and women go hand in hand. On the other side as well, a lot of the female executives spoke about the support that their life partners actually provided them with. And they said that they would not be able to do what they're doing if they didn't have a man in their corner, the husband, father, or whoever, life partner, that was helping them hold things down at home. And they accounted like having good work-life integration with having a supportive spouse. And especially when um, a man has a wife or a life partner who is entering into an issue um, sector such as banking, they will see that there's a lot of required, so a lot of support is needed in that way. So you see with the men that as allies, they're needed not just professionally, but also personally as well. Forward, how can female leadership in the banking sector be pushed more. And it requires a deliberate effort and assistance from stakeholders from beyond the industry. So we looked at some of the things that could help banks um, position more women for leadership positions. And we're looking at, for instance, if there were mandated diversity targets. So by setting specific targets and reporting requirements, regulators could hold banks accountable, ensure progress is made to achieve a, achieving greater gender diversity. And so this is something that was implemented in other parts of the world, for instance, in Europe. So in 2012, the European Commission said that um, organizations, different businesses across various sectors in Europe should have at least 40% female representation at board level. And what that ha happened was in a country, I believe it was Italy, it went from having, a bank went from having 4.1% to 
female representation on the board um, to having 40% by around 2016 or so. But what's important to know is this can't just be a checkbox exercise. This has to be that we have to groom women to be in certain positions to, for them to excel because you don't want to put somebody, whether it's a man or woman, in a position that they have not been prepared for. So that is something, looking at diversity targets, that'll be very important. Also, defining reporting standards, okay? Regulators could also require banks to provide disclosure of gender-related um, data. I'm not saying that this is something that doesn't happen already, but we can also talk about diversity initiatives. Have a set quota of diversity initiatives that banks must undertake for them to see that they are really taking the female leadership and promoting it very seriously. Um, training and resources, this is something where a firm like PwC can come into. And this is about providing training workshops to banks to help them comply with diversity and inclusion reporting and requirements. That could be in line with report writing, that could be in line with maybe um, hiring, anything that can help the banks recognize where there's some gaps, gender-related gaps, and push them as well to move forward. And lastly, both regulators and private sector organizations can engage with stakeholders such as the Ghana Association of Banks and advocacy groups to solicit feedback to ensure that banks' initiatives and female empowerment remain relative and effective. Again, it can't just happen within the industry. It has to be pushed out um, where private sector organizations, advocacy groups, and other stakeholders can also help banks see things from different perspectives. So in conclusion, Promoting female leadership in the banking sector not only ensures a fair and equal representation of talent, but also brings about positive organizational outcomes. So to drive female leadership in banking, it's important to implement effective policies and programs that promote gender equality. It's also essential to create supportive and organizational culture that fosters diversity and encourages women to thrive in their careers. Thank you very much for your time. I think we can do it again for Andrea Opoku, Jamina. That was very insightful. Um, I wrote notes, diversity inclusion, work-life integration sharing. Thank you very much for sharing the insights. The Understand the Reports will be uploaded onto the website by afternoon. So please download. Um, it's less than 20 pages, I understand, right? 13 pages. Okay, great. So 13 pages. So it's a short read, and it's important that everybody is able to read the details. But again, Andrea, thank you for that. All right, so we'll just go right into the discussions and uh, we're going to have some panel discussions. And we have panelists who are going to join us. They are already here with us. I just want to introduce them quickly and give some background so that you understand how they're selected, particularly for the special roles that they play in many things they do. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Cynthia Forsen. Cynthia Forsen is an associate professor and a deputy provost at Lancaster University, Ghana. She's also the director for external engagement West Africa for Lancaster University, UK. Prior to that, she was the head of, depart of the Department of Management, Management Leadership and Organization at the University of Hertfordshire business school. So she is an academic, as you heard, so she teaches in areas of human resource management, organizational behavior, and qualitative research methods, 
and she is a senior fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy. Her research is in the areas of equality, diversity, inclusion in the labor market and organizations. And she gives a lot of focus as well to gender, ethnicity, and migrant status in many different disciplines. Cynthia Forsen is also a board member of Carl Bank PLC and the board chair of All Star Insurance Brokers Limited. And she's as well a board member of Africa Partners Medical Ghana. Associate Professor, Professor Cynthia Forsen is particularly interested in promoting leadership of women in all sectors through professionalism and provision of skills training for women to gain access to income. Ladies and gentlemen, there's so much more to be said. Help me welcome Associate Professor Cynthia Forsen. My very first interaction with her was in the Carl Bank boardroom. And I dare say it was a very interesting conversation. You can take the first one. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to introduce Mr. John Iwa. John is a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants UK and he has several post-qualification experience and many years of senior management experience. So he has a bachelor's degree from the University of Cape Coast and an MBA from Oxford Books University UK with several work experiences cutting across financial control, credit control, financial accounting, business partnering, business analysis and corporate strategy. His banking experience is very broad. He was the head of finance at UBA. He also was a financial controller at Barclays Bank. He was also at Ecobank Capital EDC Group. He was a group CFO there. At some point in his career as well, he was at GCB Bank Limited as director of finance and chief finance officer. And there was some work he did as well at the Universal Merchant Bank. He is currently the CEO of the Ghana Association of Bankers, GAP. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Mr. John Ewa. He's definitely going to share a lot of the banking experience and all the things that he's seen, particularly in the banking sector, particularly around leadership. Welcome, Mr. John Ewa. You can take that seat. Thank you. Next. I'd like to introduce Pearl Nkrumah. Pearl is a woman driven by a profound sense of purpose and extends far beyond her corporate world. And let me share some of that. While she is indeed enjoying her banking job, she finds it exciting and valuable. She believes very much in empowering others. Her fervent advocacy for education, inclusion, and empowerment speaks volumes about her desire to make a lasting impact on society. Pearl holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Administration Market Adoption and also holds a Bachelor of Law from GIMPA and has honed her skills through executive program and prestigious, at the prestigious Harvard Business School, Authentic Leadership Development. Pearl's career path reflects her dedication to helping others to achieve her role. She's largely in, within the retail banking sector and she provides access to services and products that promote not just financial security, but also happiness and success. Beyond the boardroom, Pearl embraces adventure. A strong believer in the power of determination, she has embarked on a personal journey 
to conquer the highest mountain in Africa. A testament to her resilience and unwavering commitment to making a difference. A dedicated professional by day, Pearl is also a fitness enthusiast and a kickboxer in her free time. Her ultimate dedication lies not just in shaping the future of banking, but also leaving behind a legacy. Pearl Nkrumah's life story exemplifies the incredible power of purpose, determination, and courage. She's passionate. She's a passionate advocate for gender equity and a visionary leader who thrives, who strives to inspire and empower others. Pearl Nkrumah, welcome you to the podium. Let's appreciate her. So before we get into the discussions, I want to check with the technical team. We are streaming live on YouTube at PwC Africa. And afterwards, I'm sure a link will be dropped for us to be able to download the messages. The, uh, if, if there are any messages that are put up there, but also the report as well. So my name is Gigi Jefiajo. I prefer to be called Gig. Uh, makes life easy, and I'll be joining them to have this conversation. Thank you. All right, good morning, and it's, it's good to, I, I am glad to be here. I'm actually learning a lot, and the first thing, okay, and, and I've already started thinking about a whole lot of things. Um, so already suddenly I have a lot of favorite topics, but I have to start from somewhere. So maybe to Cynthia first. I have this question around um, imposter syndrome. And uh, in the last few days, I would say. I've had it so many times, and, and I'm beginning to wonder. I think we all have it somehow, but for some reason, I understand that women have it a lot more. That is what I came to understand. What is your opinion, and what can banks do to foster the culture of confidence and empowerment? All right, good morning, and, and thank you for the question. Actually, before I go I never follow the rules. Um, it's to say a really... Are the men trying to... <laughs> okay. I want to say a really big thank you to PwC for this uh, report because I think it's extremely important. Um, I do a lot of work in equality and diversity, as you've heard, um, and I think what is missing in this landscape is information on middle-class working African women. There's a lot of information because the development agenda of um, our foreign partners um, tend to focus on um, development issues, so the broad issues of education and health and so on and so forth. But we have very little information on how African women are actually doing in the labor market and in organizations as they try and go up um, the ladder. There's a lot of information about women in other jurisdictions. The second thing I would like to say, and sorry, Jij, I'm taking up your time, but I think it's important to say it, is that um, if you Google three words, women, work, Europe, images. You'll get, you can do it while I'm, talk, I'm speaking. What you'll get is a variety of images, history, uh, statistics, women working from home, women doing men's jobs. You get a, 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 what, what Chimamanda Adichie refers to as a multiplicity of stories about women and work in Europe. Change one word from Europe to Asia and then you begin to get sort of a homogenous view. Most of the women are young, they're in suits, and they're in middle management. This is just images. 
I'm just giving you a nice guess. If you change Asia to Africa, what do you think? What images do you get? Women carrying firewood, carrying children on the farm, beasts of burden. We, the women in this room, as far as Google is concerned, we don't exist. There is only one story of African women at work. So I'm really grateful to PwC for this work. It's really important work. Now, imposter syndrome. I just read an article by Harvard Business Review in 2021, which says, stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. Because being nervous, in my view, when you go into a job the first time, or you're given a big project to do, or you're um, you know, given something that's a little bit out of your comfort zone, is normal. Men feel uncomfortable when they're given big jobs. Women feel uncomfortable. But somehow we zero in on women when they're feeling something that is a natural human feeling and we say, hmm, you have a problem, and that problem needs to be fixed. So unfortunately, that's my view of imposter syndrome. I think it's normal. It's not a women's issue necessarily, but I also believe that if women feel it more, it's because they are told it is more, and also because the environments in which they work make them feel as if they don't belong. So. I'm all for fixing the environment as opposed to fixing women. Sorry, I don't know if that's what the answer you're expecting, but... No, that, that, that answers it actually. So, fixing the environment, so we should actually uh, create an environment that allows um, us to, to all grow confidently, isn't yes. it? Or be, be confident about things. I think I like yes. that. All right. So, John, before I come to you, I just want to jump to Pearl quickly. So th there's this other um, concept as well, knowing all the things that you do. Work-life integration, some call it balance. I prefer integration because it looks like uh, you can keep it on two sides. What is, what is your take on that and how can we, first as humans and also as females, be able to um, achieve this work-life integration? Thank you very much. and. Uh... I was so excited in how you answered <laughs> that question. Um, I, I've, someone told me, and I think that was when it was like a mother snapping it out of me, um, because I kept asking myself, what am I doing here? Why am I in this boardroom? Um, I, I sit on the Ghana Stock Exchange, um, board. And I remember the first time we were having the AGM, I was standing there feeling, what the heck is this? What's wrong with you? So I finished and went to see um, a lady coach I know. And I said, I think I have imposter syndrome. And he, she looked at me and said, you women like labels. Once you give it a name, we have given it a name and we have taken it upon ourselves and now we call it imposter syndrome. Pearl, go and Google it and come and tell me what it is. And my find, like I kept, I actually did the work. And I realized if it doesn't scare you, then it's not big enough. So that's what we call imposter syndrome. So if any opportunity that is given or position you are in, if you really are not working in scared, that this is so big, I need to give my 120%, then it's not right. The most important thing is you just have to do it afraid, then you are doing it. And that's what probably why we draw the difference between men and women, because a man will walk in no matter what and will do it. We will start put labels and calling it imposter syndrome. So I really agree. And I've stopped using that word because seriously, I don't think it exists anyway. So work-life integration. Hmm. Um, I like how we've changed it from balance to integration. And um, it, it's, I believe, for instance, as women, there are certain things that biologically we have. 
I call it uh, a pause. You will give birth. Your ch you have to take care of your child sometimes because you alone can breastfeed and do other things. And you need to also um, grow in your career. For me, integrating is ensuring that at each point in time, what is of value is what you give importance to. You can't have it um, at the same pace. So it's okay for you to stop work and go and take care of what matters most, which is your child or uh, some family person demanding your attention as a woman without feeling um, scared or without judging yourself. We are judged a lot and we also judge ourselves a lot. We put some stereotypes on ourselves to the extent that I can't get my, I can't put my career to a certain level because I'm a woman. But everyone has to integrate into whatever environment or society that they live in by making sure that they are able to know at each point in time what is of value, give it attention and prepare. You also can't do it alone and there's nothing on this, like you can't go in alone. So knowing when to ask for help will help you in, in doing this. There's nothing wrong asking for help. There's nothing wrong with um, saying that I have three nannies just so that at this point in my life, I can represent in the boardroom. You will not get the excuse, you can't make excuses because you are a woman when you are supposed to attend a board meeting just because you have to close at four o'clock. When really, maybe the board meeting is at five o'clock, when the help is available. So we just have to seek help and not, be, not, not feel guilty about it. And I think one last thing that I will say is, Knowledge is confidence. So when you are knowledgeable, um, any environment that you place yourself in, it's, you are, it's quite easy for you to feel um, that you are part and you count. And um, whatever you, you see, what, what the technical skills and uh, other skills that organization needs, you prepared yourself for it. So that's for me is what um, I would say uh, matters most when it comes to integrating yourself into their work life. Thank you. Okay, so, so just still on that, right? Um, I grew up learning that women can juggle a million things. <laughs> uh, still, still haven't figured out how true that is. Um, so if I hear you clearly, the, it is really around um, not feeling guilty if you are getting help and also planning and focusing on all the things that are important. Would that be right? Or we can just lump it all together and then juggle because you know, we have multitasking. <laughs> we, we say women multitask. I think we all do. Um, I, I don't believe that men can not do that. Uh, we, there's this thing about you wake up in the morning and you go through almost two thousand like your brain to pick even one dress and i think men have the same kind of i i bring it back to claiming certain things um we we all have it left brain right brain we all have that that in us but you cannot do something to the extent that it's at the risk that we talked about mental health just because you were a woman, so you try to do everything by yourself without seeking for support or without seeking for help. Because, like I said, you bring your person to, 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 to the workplace, you as a person, a mother, sometimes a wife, a friend, uh, a whole village with you, a leader and a team player. You can't carry it all if you don't learn to delegate and if you don't learn to raise your hand and say, you know what, I need help here. Just help me. It doesn't mean I can't do the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, so John, I come to you um, maybe more on the environment side. So what are some of the misconceptions 
not so much just in the business environment that we have about uh, women's leadership abilities. What are the ones you've come across or what are the ones that have been shared with you? We are just trying to get a sense of what is within the environment and also connecting to what um, Andrea shared in the presentation. And in your view, what can male leaders do to address some of these misconceptions? We, we, we believe that there are misconceptions indeed based on the conversations that we've had already. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I would like to thank the, all the women who participated in this um, survey. Um, these are stories that must be heard. And um, I like when I went through the report and I saw at the tail end, the call to the regulators and other market players to take action, um, I took that as quite a call. And um, hopefully it gets to the, the appropriate desks for, for us to Yes, progress has been made, but to um, accelerate the pace of, of whatever progress. Um, just to put it in perspective, so we understand exactly um, why we are where we are, um, first globally, and Ghana is fitting more or less within the global, um, global numbers or um, architecture. The, the issue from history has been, um, and I think the, the report came out quite clearly um, with it around the stereotyping um, setting happiness within the work environment. And sometimes the stereotypes don't go um, favorably um, to, to, to certain groups. Um, and, and here, as we are discussing about gender, um, I'll say uh, women co colleagues. Uh, I'll go as I started by saying that we, we need to cast our minds back. I remember um, several years ago um, at the advanced level um, when we were going for our A level exams. We were, for accounting, uh, we were just about 23 in the, in the room um, for, for, for that program, and we had two women part of the, the, that class. If, if I took all the um, A-level candidates at the time, I think women would have been about 55% because it was a missed school, 55% or even more. Um, than, so I asked myself, why did we have only two opting for a certain kind of program? And that initially fed into what we found to be certain um, um, roles, more or less, um, becoming a preserve of, uh, of, of men. I'm talking about the, uh, the environment, the technology, accounting, um, 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 risk, I think we are talking about um, banks here. But over time, now if you go back to business schools, um, a lot of the classes, women are numbering men. And that is the next frontier. These are coming through the work environment. They are going to form the next leadership team so um, I want to look at the brighter side of the, of the trajectory that, yes, the pace of the movement has not been um, as we would all have wished, but um, there's a lot of progress that also must be recognized. I remember um, when we started um, my career in banking several years, maybe over two decades, um, they were at the C-suite, you could just in the entire industry, you could just count on your fingertips. There are banks now that at the C-suite, we are having you know, uh, almost a balance uh, in terms of uh, uh, male-female participation. But that is beside the point. The other thing, I, I don't like to give it a name, but you cannot but also say that that thing which was highlighted on the, on the screen about certain, um, should I say, exaggerated um, target for ourselves that sometimes uh, limits our, our, our progress because we set the bar so high for ourselves. It's real. And it is real um, uh, when you consider how our female colleagues at the workplace have processed certain internal, maybe job advertisements, or opportunities that come. Who are going to be the next leaders? 
90% of them are the next year. It's hardly would you find people jumping from maybe supervisory to become an executive director. It's more or less going to come from a certain layer. But I'll give an example. I mean, not too long ago, uh, there was a job placement. And really, if I looked through the entire bank, I could pinpoint almost the person who was more capable to do the job. But of course, you need to advertise. And when it was advertised, uh, curiosity, I just asked for the candidates who, who applied, and that name was missing. And I said, I called. I said, why did you not apply? Are you not interested? Oh, I am, but you know, this job, and uh, I do not think it is. I, I, if, if I apply, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to get. So the stereotyping is not um, um, like an organizational imposed stereotyping, but sometimes we have imposed certain limitations on us that limits, you know, our, you know, our capabilities and what we are capable. And we all know that as a, as a banking industry, the more the, the diverse the discussions, the more the, 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 the better the outcome or the decisions that comes out of those discussions. And um, we are in a risk industry. And for risk, the, 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 the variety of perspectives are critical. That is why in most banks, and the facility is above a certain threshold, they say take it to a committee. It does not mean that they are more competent than maybe the risk team, but they want a lot more voices, a lot more eyes on the risk parameters. So having ladies at the table, I'm, I'm not sure uh, is anything that anybody here would discount, because we need a lot more. And particularly, it's 50% of voices that would have been excluded if we are having just about 29% of ladies represented at the board. But environmentally, um, I think we, we, our, our women folks must also you know, handhold a lot more. You know, we've had uh, instances where, uh, uh, when you say environmental, you do internal surveys and it's coming out as women not also handholding colleagues or um, 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 other women because uh, it took a certain time or certain effort to get to a certain level and if we are going to have to accelerate somebody uh, it becomes more of a dicey situation how do we move you when it took me like you we are just we are both women it took me 15 years to get to this point you are here three years and you are you know getting closer or wanting to move to there. But we need that to be more intentional. And um, as men, as partners, to also support any kind of program that facilitates that journey. The last one I will say, um, and that will, will, will touch on the issue of the em environmental. I do not think, I'm having been part of several interview panels, particularly at the C-suite level. I mean, I, I can say, at, at least 20 years, you know, recruiting at that level, I can conveniently say, sitting here, they're not speaking for um, um, this unconscious bias um, phenomenon that people talk, to talk about. I haven't entered an interview room where the decision has been, we are looking for a man. I have not. The decision has always been, we are looking for the best person for the role. But do we have a system that gets the best people to apply? Because if there are inhibitions that people have also placed on themselves, then the opportunity or the basket that we are dealing with is what we are dealing with. It becomes a problem of uh, 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 not just an environmental issue, but sometimes uh, um, women also stepping out to the to plate and claiming that which, uh, in our view, perhaps they deserve more than the men who put themselves up for. Okay, no, great, thank you. Um, I, I think the ladies want to speak as well. Uh, so let's start with uh, Cynthia first, yeah. Thank you very much for your perspective, John. But I also think that your perspective possibly comes from a position of privilege, and I call it male privilege. Um, and it's not something bad necessarily. It's um, 
something that uh, it's like being in a fishbowl and never getting out of the fishbowl and because you don't get out of the fishbowl you don't actually realize that you are surrounded by water because you don't know anything else the problem with um, this whole discussion is that sometimes we don't actually realize what um, how privileged men are in a patriarchal society there are certain things that men don't even have to think about so take for example a man and a woman get married they decide to have children they will talk about finances they will talk about you know do they have a big enough house um, blah 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 it is the woman who has to ask herself how do I go and tell my boss I'm pregnant? How is this going to impact on my career? When I leave the office and I go on maternity leave, when I come back, that promotion I've been looking at for 15 years is coming up. Will I get it? I've been sitting in this room here. There are women in this room who woke up this morning, got dressed for work, and this is work, while they were making breakfast for their children, their clothes got spilt with some of the breakfast. Their husbands, hope, assume, I assume, got dressed and of course he's wearing his suit and he's going to do a very important job. So, she, you know, she has to give the, 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 the tea or the coffee or whatever, the milo to the children. It goes in her clothes. Time is going. She rushes upstairs, gets dressed, changes into whatever she can find comes back down says time is going she's conscious that what she's wearing might not be appropriate because she's rushed through getting dressed um, to make it on time she gets here and then she's on the phone because her son is calling her asking her about something she's asking the son uh, so are you going to work will you will you do your homework uh, daddy says you should do this and I was listening to all these conversations and some of the women didn't even realize that I was listening but daddy says you should do this and daddy says this now why can't daddy pick up the phone and call the child because daddy's doing a very important job and a friend of mine says that women um, uh, make all the decisions in the home that are not important what will we eat um, the, 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 the nutrition of the family um, uh, where, what will we, where will we live what schools will their children go to all those minor decisions and the men take very important decisions whether America should go to war with Iran and they do this in front of CNN sitting in front of CNN while the women are making these mundane life outcome decisions right so it is real these women in in integrating life, uh, 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 work-life balance, the work intrudes into the home. The home intrudes into their work. They feel guilty. They feel shame. They are let. They 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 are not able to engage in networking because while the men are on the golf course on Saturday morning, they have to be at home looking at homework, doing the swimming. The the children want to go to tennis or whatever it is they they, they do. Um, they, they, they left out of training and development events. Um, when a project comes up, if you don't have a boss who is conscious and deliberate, the first thing they think of, she, nah, she's not here most of the time. Yeah, let me get this man. He'll be here. He'll do it. In the banks, we have a presenteeism culture. If you are there, you are working. It's a lie. They come at nine. They will talk uh, till five. And then when everybody has left from five to nine, they will work. They've been, they've been at work from nine to nine, but they've only worked four hours. But a woman who has to go pick up her kids from school will work, has negotiated flexible working with her boss. So she knows eyes are on her. If she doesn't get the work done from nine, between nine and three, six hours, that flexible working will be at risk. So she will buckle down and she'll get the same job done in six hours. So work-life integration, sir, is, is, is a, um, a real difficult area for women. 
men do it too. I mean, men, I was having a conversation with Gigi about, you know, how men balance their work and, um, and men seem to be skewed onto the other side. So it's all work and sometimes too much work. And I was saying to him that, you know, to be honest, me, if you are my employee and you work from nine in the morning to 10 every day, you leave home, the office at 10, my view is that you are inefficient. If you can't get the work done between nine and five, you are inefficient. So look at the way you work. Do you understand me? And I think that the, the bank culture actually creates some kind of special, you know, what we're doing here is so important to the economy. We have to be here till midnight, please. It's banking which is as important as any industry, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that great perspective, Phil. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I was also going to add that we, I think we have a problem, especially in the banking sector. I am in the banking sector. And of the 23 banks, having just two women at the top is a big issue that we need to be deliberate and intentional to fix. The report talked about Nigeria having seven women. Within this year, they've added three more. So Nigeria now have 11 managing directors for the 25 banks. In Ghana, we have two. It is a problem. And the two I've looked, I've checked today, I, I look and I feel, hmm, we might end up probably having one. When, when, because, like you said, the middle, so this is a pyramid, and the, the aggressive middle is also drying up. So this is something that I believe as um, your organization, uh, we, we, I like what PwC has done by making, bringing visibility to this conversation. But we have to be intentional and set ourselves goals, hold people accountable to say this has to be fixed. We have great and awesome women who are capable of also running some of these banks. And just as she, she said, there are a lot of things that if we don't pull and make way, and bring them to that interview room, we will always think that really, I don't need to be there. For instance, one of the things that I realized Nigeria was doing, they scan the market. They scan, South Africa did the same thing. They scan the market and said, okay, you don't necessarily need to be in this same organization, but is there a lady somewhere who can be this else we cannot? And the higher up, you talk that the, the, the decision-making part is very, very important that the, at least we have some sense of balance. So I was going to ask that let's be intentional, let's set the goals, and um, whatever training that we think we need, whatever preparedness that we think we need, let's start bringing these medal to the point and start holding people accountable to say, you know what, this has to change. And give ourselves timeline to make sure that it changes because it's not looking good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think it's very clear. <laughs> Let's be intentional, right? Uh, so it's not just, if we leave it at default settings, uh, society yeah. is, is, is going to hold sway. Okay, so thank you for that. I'm just looking at my time, but I know there are questions in the audience, right? Uh, there are questions. Okay, so we can take some of those. Um, do I need to pass up my mic? You're okay, all right. So if there's a question, please put up your hand um, so that the panelists can. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Slur. I have a question about something that is very cultural, but as Cultural values in society enters the business world, enters the workplace, and people take behaviors from our societies into 
the workplace, and that's the issue around sexual harassment, and not just sexual, but harassment, bullying, and assault of ver various forms. And so with, especially sexual harassment, which is very, very dangerous, what do you think we are doing enough to combat these behaviors in banking workplaces and in workplaces in general? And what more could businesses do, or what more could we do to combat these behaviors in the industry? Thank you very much. Um, first, to you know, add my voice to what has already been said about being intentional, about whatever journey um, 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 as, as an industry we, we are embarking on, you know, on this gender and inclusion um, pursuit. Um, the, the, the first one as an industry, my view, we should do, and which from the report, um, most of all the banks are doing is having these diversity and inclusion programs. But it's not enough to, to, to have a program and the erroneous uh, rollout that we have seen is when it is seen as an HR, one of the HR pillars, um, and not more of a business model issue. Um, the HR is critical to the business of banking, but the moment you place gender inequality within the same um, environment, you are making it a, an issue for HR, but it's, it's an executive accountable issue. And for organizations that have made progress in moving the target from the status to you know, a more progressive ta um, um, benchmark, um, they've had accountable executives at the very top. And in most instances, it's either the CEO or the next person, and not necessarily a woman, but anybody who has that activist or activism of, about women issues, you know, as part of their work culture, uh, as leading the, the, the charge. And when we set up these um, diversity programs, the, the pace to from start to the finish line should visibly, we should see people moving. You know, that is the only way you build confidence into the process. Otherwise, it will become one of the bank's attempts at showing to the public that we are pursuing this agenda. So I'm very much within that space, and I think as an industry, there's a lot more, and perhaps even as an association, a lot more we can do to drive this kind of um, philosophy. But the point about uh, sexual harassment and other forms of harassment, my personal view is, um, as an industry, I'm not sure we've done enough. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about it. There's not a single bank that does not have a policy on um, ethics and you know, uh, business conduct. We ought actually have one for the entire industry. We worked with Bank of Ghana and the Chartered Institute of Bankers to, to launch et ethics and business conduct. And sexual harassment is a major pillar in that. Do we make it such that you know, they say what gets measured gets done, and consequence is everything. When these things are reported, what reporting mechanisms do we have? Because it becomes a more pronounced harassment when there is this significant variations in levels, particularly involving a junior staff and a very senior person, and you find that the process is dragging on and on and on and on and on, and all of a sudden maybe uh, a certain letter is issued and some, the, the process fizzles out in one way or the other. It, it, it does not promote uh, a culture where um, sexual harassment or any other form of harassment is frowned on and is actively pursued to the extent that irrespective of who you are, you know, when you are caught in that web, you, you, you will not survive. We've seen it elsewhere where people have been prosecuted from the board level because they've had these kind of instances. And I think as an industry, um, um, and here the, the regulator can play some significant role in how banks manage the process. It's not enough having um, uh, these kind of mechanisms in place, but how fluid and transparent, and also to what extent, if people want to be anonymous, to what extent we have protective measures you know, embedded in the process to cover up those who do not want to show face because of fear of you know, um, 
other forms of intimidation. Yeah. Okay, clearly policy document is not enough. Pell, you wanted to say something? Yes. Um, so thank you, and I think that's a, a, a great perspective to that. And like you said, it's embedded in most of the governance structures we have in all the banking institutions. I'll take it another way. So career-wise, I believe currently the internal policies makes it a bit stringent um, for you or for senior leaders to get out of, of um, being, once the, the speaker policy is well practiced, then we know the consequence. The other part is how external parties tend to harass the, the staff. And that for me is where the associations or the women associations or the within the banks have to be very bold to say, for instance, as a client, we will not uh, entertain or we don't agree to you harassing a, a staff member. That for me is another way we need to look at because currently by looking at the internal framework policies and other things we 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 i think we uh, it, it's a it's better and it's really getting better but there's another angle to it where your staff are being seen as objects um, to be harassed to be spoken to uh, in any way um, and to be treated as, for lack of better, commod because they are there to serve you. And that is something that we also need to get to the point where we put a document and a framework around it and add our voice to the fact that as a banking industry, this is not encouraged as well. So Cynthia, what are, what are your thoughts on sexual harassment, the elephant in the room? Oh, plenty. I think sexual harassment is a power issue. And, um, you know, if, if you look in, let's, let's keep to the banks, um, who holds power and who doesn't? And as soon as you're in an unequal power relationship with somebody, they have certain advantages and you are immediately at a disadvantage. So coming back to work-life integration, you imagine a woman who's trying to keep a work-life balance, right? We haven't talked, we've talked about all the issues at work, time poor, um, networking, training, promotion. But at home, there's also domestic tension. Because as she tries to forge through her career, somebody at home who needs his meal cooked and his clothes washed and his children looked after by somebody else, um, is also giving wahala uh, on the other side. Many women who climb up the ladder end up with very, diff and this is research, difficult marriages or get divorced. If you look in Europe, the many women who are right at the top are single or divorced. And so when you're trying to do this in your environment and the person who wields the power to give you flexible working to help you to get into project driven, uh, 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 into projects, to help you with promotion. And that person is saying to you, ah, if you want to, you know, get into this project or do this or move on with your career, this is the cost. You have to make a decision. So for me, sexual harassment is about power in organizations. And if we can get women into the upper echelons and into decision-making roles, we would reduce that power that men have. And I, I, I do apologize here. This isn't a men against women, women against men issue. This is real and it is life. And we know that individual men can be good people. We're talking about a system, a system issue here. So I think power relations is a big one when it comes to sexual harassment. I also think that we tend to hide behind policy. 
oh, we have a whistleblowing policy and we have um, um, sexual harassment policy and we do training. You know the list Andrea put up? How about the culture of the bank? How about the culture of the bank? Is sexual harassment glossed over? Oh, you too, uh, you are too sensitive. We are dodo, you know, and all the things that we say. It is, um, 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 I think the culture is very, very important. The culture, if people know, men and women, because I have to say, women also harass. Okay? So, if men and women within organizations know that this will not be tolerated at any level, they will stop doing it. But if it's glossed over, as John has said, you know, they start an investigation and then somewhere down the line you get a letter that says that actually you, I, I, I have somebody I know who got a letter after a whole investigation to say she doesn't understand Ghanaian culture. It was in the report. I suppose Ghanaian culture is about sexual harassment, but anyway. But let me say this about being deliberate. The Bank of Ghana has principles around uh, sustainability principles that require all banks to have a gender equality framework underpinned by gender equality policy, right? Okay, what, what, what do we do? Do we just simply uh, get HR to put together a policy and that's about it? No. Really, if we're gonna put together a proper gender equality framework, it must start with a gender impact assessment of the bank. So you start with how, if you, if you apply gender principles to every policy and process in the bank, how would that policy and process come out? Recruitment, selection, training, uh, reward management, all the HR policy cycle. If we apply gender there, would women be at a disadvantage? How do our policies and our pro uh, processes stand up? So you do a gender impact assessment. When you have decided on how gender impacts on these policies, you need to re look at every single policy across the bank and re-engage the board, management, uh, senior management, middle management, and the entire organization. That's the only way to do it properly. But, you know, somebody in HR sits there and types out a gender framework. That's not gonna work. It has to be at all levels. So we start with a gender impact assessment. We look at all policies and practices. How do they impact women in the organization? What is the promotion policy? Was gender considered when we're developing a promotion policy? Was it considered when we're developing a recruitment and selection policy? Was gender considered when we're developing a flexible working policy? Do you know, research shows that men in organizations, in banks in particular, believe that um, work-life integration is a huge problem for women. They recognize it. But they also think that flexible working is the least necessary policy in the bank. How do, you, how do you marry those two opinions? So we have to look at everything, apply gender to it, reassess it, then come up with a policy that tackles diversity, workforce diversity itself, the culture, and then our products and processes. We can't talk about being gender friendly when our products are not what we actually sell, whether it's services or uh, 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 banking products, whatever it is, that might also, also be gender impact assessed. Can women assess your banking products? How easy is it for a woman to get a loan? What collateral are you asking for? What, how do you assess a woman's risk uh, profile? You know, women are better at paying their loans back. Do we agree? but they get higher interest rates because they are women. So we have a lot of work to do in the banking sector, Mr. John. 
<laughs> and in the, in the, in the banking, uh, 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 banking Association, we have a lot of work to do, and I hope that you will be our male ally and champion us as we go forward. Yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course, and I'm happy you talked about the sustainable banking uh, principles. I believe it's principle five that talks about gender inequality. And it's not just a pillar. It runs, if, if you are putting together that program, it must run through the entire organizational setting. So I'm sure we are making some very good progress in this area. And as I said, um, sometimes when you are making progress, I don't cast your mind to see where are we coming from. You, it's difficult to see progress. Um, knowing where we've come from, I can say that yes, a lot more work is needed, but a lot of progress has been achieved. You know, particularly in the last you know, few years, maybe five years, you know, from from from, where, from this time. In another five years, perhaps the pace of that progress will be, you know, double or uh, triple, and then we can have a lot more of what um, yeah. the two of you have said. And as you have said, I'm not sure men are against women moving yeah. to that table. It's a matter of do we have the systems that encourage and also propel a lot of women to get to that table. And um, as banks, I think we take this discussion very seriously. Yeah. And on board, yeah. So I, as seriously as we take risk, Cynthia <laughs> says. So I'm hearing two things already. We have to be deliberate. And we shouldn't just be ticking the box. I think I can take another question. I can take another. Okay, that's it. Okay, there are two hands actually. So, um, please, go um, please, my name is Mami Kunedu Ekuyama from Prudential Bank. And um, please, when we, when it comes to balancing work and life circumstances, I want to know how banks are able to support women during these life events without disadvantaging them, especially when it comes to mental challenge. Okay, who, who would like to take that? I'll just let one panelist take that, then we'll take the next question right after that, yeah. And we can chip in, yeah. Okay, Fail. I was expecting this. <laughs> 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 um, but maybe I'll just give my, um, what I believe should be done and some of the things that's been done. Um, so Cynthia touched on the flexible working um, arrangement, which is no longer a privilege, but it's something that we need to institute in, in, in the organization. And it's because it's needed. Um, once you put in the tools, it doesn't matter where the person is working. You should be able to measure whether the person is being proactive or not. And that is the responsibility of the organization to do that so that they can actually encourage the culture of flexibility in the workspace. And I believe that if women are given especially that opportunity, um, the balance or the integration would to some extent be achieved because I can sit anywhere and work and still be able to take care of my child or not rush to the upstairs and go and change my dress because seriously, the day is not going well. Can I at least today work from home without feeling um, guilty? So I think that flexibility is, 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 is quite key. Um, so for instance, in my organization, we, we have uh, an external employee kind of um, employee psychologist to some extent where we give opportunity for women and other staff members to be able to call and speak to someone as outside um, the organization and someone who understands is a professional and also who understand some of the, um, the challenges, the peculiar challenges that we go through. So this is something that has been set aside to say, how do we give people the space to talk? How do we give people the space to seek for the help that, that they need? We have, and from the research we touched on, women associations in banks. And like you said, is it just a policy or is it a cultural intention that these are specific gender types that have peculiar um, things that we need to pay attention to. And uh, for that, we allow them to operate, meet, 
and discuss their, um, the, the, the peculiar stuff that um, affects them. So for instance, when you set up a women association, do we go to the boardroom and we, we hold the patron or the HR person responsible to say, what did you do this month particularly for women? Not because it's women's month or anything, but you add it to your report and come and talk about how many women have you impacted? How many women have you given them opportunity to come and talk to you? How many women have you created an environment for them to be coached and for them to also be able to, when they are even being harassed externally, they are able to come to the table to discuss it? Because culturally as Ghanaians, we hardly say no, and we really find it difficult to speak up when certain things have been done to us, and especially women. And if you have that in your environment and you don't create, you are not intentional about creating that avenue for that to be done, the cultural nuances will, will come in and you will not be able to achieve what you set up. So flexibility, um, external help, investing in that for people to talk, and also creating that environment where people get to speak up without being judged and without being looked as if you're a woman and you're just complaining, I believe helps. Thank okay, and, and that really rests with the organization more. It, 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 that it rests um, with the organization. Even if I don't want, like I said, if our environment, we hardly speak no, the, envir the organization being, making it as a culture. So speak up is not just a policy, but the avenues are also being created to, for, for that to happen. And we are very intentional about saying, how many women have used this avenue to talk? How many women have come forward? And then we showcase what has been done just because a woman um, um, came forward will help uh, a lot. Yeah. Okay, uh, I want to use this word, word wrongly. I'm multitasking now. Ask your question. I'm sure there are other views, but you can actually tie them in. So. Okay, thank you, Jade. We can hear you. Emmy. Oh, excellent. Okay, so mine is a comment and a question. Oh, a few years ago, I took up a job at Cal Bank. I work with Cal Bank. And the nature of my job required that I am in everybody's business all the time um, because I was responsible for ensuring that the bank is performing. Now, while I had to deal with men who are much older, thinking that I am either too young or simply a woman, so I couldn't ask them questions, I, my biggest problem I found came from my fellow women um, in that, as I think that Dr. Forsen, you made a point uh, in, in our local language, hey, yeah, do, do. Uh, why are you this extra, you know? Why can't you just be quiet and sit down? Um, my comment is, we as women leaders in this room, can we just resolve that we will uplift each other and not try to put each other down? And to the panel, how can we resolve things like these? Because some people don't survive it. You know, some people actually will crawl in their shells and just refuse to do anything else because it's, it's a form of harassment. So how do we deal with things like that? Um, and I guess it's cultural, but how do we deal with it? Cynthia, is this when the yeah. men walk away can I and say it's a woman one? fight? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you see, my response to, 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 to that is, if you were a man and you were dealing with other men and the other men gave you pushback, would you complain that they were giving you pushback because they are men? You see what I mean? So what we do is because it's always women are visible because they are in the minority. So what happens is every time a woman or a group of women do something, it's because they are women. Not because they're human beings or just nasty people, right? It's because they're women. And I think that in itself is a problem. Because what it then does is that it causes women to, in some respects, have false expectations of each other, right? So, oh, women, older women and women in higher places, they don't mentor their young ones. How many men 
mentor young men. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So we put these expectations on women. And it's not just a women issue. I mean, when I, was, when I worked in the UK, it was a black issue. If a black person does something in the organization, everybody can notice it. Do you see what I mean? So it's, when you're in the minority, you are more visible than when you're in the majority. So uh, my answer to your question is that, you know, they, they did it because, you know, they, they're just people. And perhaps you unfortunately had a, a, a number of not very nice people um, in the organization. It, that would be my, my view. One thing I just wanted to add quickly um, to what Pearl said um, about um, um, the putting uh, things in place is um, particularly with regard to work-life integration is that, you know, when we put the policies in place, who implements? Line managers, right? And John said, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. I am a huge advocate, so Garbank, watch out, is coming. I'm a huge advocate for putting gender impact in line managers' KPIs. Then we can measure it. This whole year, what have you done? Because if it's going to affect your bonus, you will do something about it, right? So as far as I'm concerned, it's not just in the policy level. Put it in the KPIs all the way down from MD, all the way down to the list of line managers and supervisors. And then it becomes part of the culture of the organization. Otherwise, it doesn't get done, just at policy level. Yeah. <laughs> but as I understand and, and, and I agree to um, particularly the point, um, Cynthia, you make about um, because women are in the minority, um, I believe that there is also value in analyzing the, the numbers. If just yesterday, incidentally, you know, I, this, I wish, I think two days ago that I confirmed that I can be part of this. But yesterday, we do get calls at the association, if you know, people call us about all, all kinds of problems that they experience, and we are able, in some instances, to mediate, and we resolve things quickly. Just yesterday, a call from a female um, supervisor, I'm sure, in one of the banks, and wanted an advice on what she should do because she has a sense or a, a general sense that her, her female line manager is unduly targeting and stressing her. Um, and we do get quite a number of these um, um, instances where some women believe that women, some women leaders are tougher on colleague women. And I'm not sure we can, we can brush it aside. Perhaps it's not the predominant uh, um, reason for the situation that you have described, but it's real. It's real and it's something that if we want to handhold and we are leaders as females or women, we need, we are not saying be uh, soft, but the balance should be spread almost evenly. Um, I'm not sure you do it because it's women, but maybe as uh, um, um, two people from the same, um, you see things you know, differently and the kind of state that goes there um, is you know, a, a, a bit of a bigger stake than the stake that goes to um, my, my friends um, who may be on the same line of fire. So it, it's an issue. Perhaps um, next year when PwC is uh, conducting this kind of survey, it will be good to test it to see on the levels up who is your line manager, what is your view, how do you do your 360 assessment of this line manager so that we can also use data in our case, to, to, to sense check, because we, we get it all across, and I'm sure a lot of the women here may have heard that, that there are instances that they get 
um, 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 comments like women are tougher on women than on their um, a male counterparts. And I think it's a phenomenon that must be tested. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, my, my Bell, Bell has something to say. I, uh, just, just, just before you come in, I, I think the conversation is, even, is getting even more interesting. But what, what I want to do is that, so you, you will respond, <laughs> and then afterwards, I, I'll just ask you, we'll go around to, to give some closing remarks so that we can have private conversations as well. So you, you go. Uh, you already had something to say. I, I, I think, and maybe the women leaders here who work in the banking sector or maybe other institutions might bear me out, but I really think um, we don't tolerate we don't want women to be leaders and show up as a leader, we as, uh, as women. So back to the same question that you asked. If a, a man had done this, sometimes we don't, we think that's my boss. Ah, this my boss is tough. You know? This my boss is very tax oriented. This is how my boss wants it to be done. But just as a woman tends to be strong and show up, we sometimes take it as he's doing, she's doing it too much. So I had this principle because I encountered this a lot when I started my leadership um, journey. And especially um, those who've worked with me, if you have energy and passion as a woman, sometimes you show up too strong for other people. So I made it a point that when I am working with women, the, I used to say the patient's ladder is very, very, you can test me. You can do whatever you want. I will never give you the opportunity to say because we are two women, that's why we are having issues. And I realized that the men were also watching. So all the problems that I've had in my career with women were fueled by someone who is at the corner and watching how we will knock our heads together. No, I'm, it's, it's, it's a practical. And sometimes it's so nice that the women just walk into it. They just walk into it. So I've had issues where someone shows up at work and I really realized that that day the dress, uh, the dressing was in. So I called and said, oh, what's, what's the problem? Is everything okay? Uh, I guess you were in a hurry. So, and that's, that's how, because that's not how the person dressed. I said, I guess you were in a hurry. This is, and the, the next thing was that, you see, because I haven't dressed like her, she's now talking about my dressing and because I have this, because I have, so I was called. And I was like, leave it to us. And I will never discuss this with a man. I'm like, oh, leave it to us. I'll go back to her and have a conversation. And so my patient level, the way I would deal with a man, I normally don't deal with like that with a woman because I know that's what the woman is expecting. The woman is just expecting that something will happen and they will use it because. And I would normally say that when we say women are their own enemies, it was said by a man and created by men and fooled by men. We don't really have, we are judged, I, Andrea will tell you when I think at the point we're having a conversation and as a woman leader, the, the first thing I told her was that I'm exhausted, seriously, and I would, I'm exhausted. You speak up, you are too emotional. You are quiet, you are sulking. You dress up in a way, oh goodness, what you too colorful. You are dark, are you okay? It's, it's too, you get home and you can't bring your superwoman to this. Here, you have to respect. Your family calls you and it's like, we are not one of your people in the uh, office, so you need to speak. It's too, it's too, it's a lot. And I won't, I will like, I will like to you, that's one of the things I deal with. It's a lot. Your team members are expecting you to behave like a mother and allow things to just go because you should understand. 
the people who need the coaching, they're expecting you to tell them that, you know what, don't step up. Just go and still you can go through stuff. Someone will approach you, I want to be a mentor, but the, uh, I want you to mentor me. And the mentoring means hold my hand. And when you say, no, no, this and this and this is what you have to do, no, you don't know what I'm going through. So it's a lot. And when you wake up in the morning and sometimes you're stepping up and you are asking yourself, which direction am I going? Before you open your mouth, sometimes you are juggling a lot in your head. You are in the boardroom and you are like, you don't want to say something so that it, it doesn't look like because you are a woman. So it's a lot. And I believe that as women, we need to be intentional to allow the leaders to lead. There's a code for leadership. It's not whether you are a man or you are a woman. You just need to lead. And if we will support the women to be the leaders that they should be and drive that organization in a stronger way without being judged, it will help a lot. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for that. I think, uh, please, you, you, shared, you shared a lot. It's a lot. And that's what I'll say. <laughs> it's a lot. So l let me just take final comments. Uh, I'll start with you, Cynthia. Uh, yeah okay thank you yes i agree with pearl we are exhausted and so for me i will reiterate something that paul kagami said at a conference that i went to on african economic transformation we had a number of leaders there and they, as usual you know a room full of people actually it was here in kempinski and um we had the, um, our, our president was there, um, um, Dangote was there, um, Nsako, I've forgotten his first name. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, he was there and uh, um, Kigami was there. And, um, you know, they went around the panel, as we're doing here, asking questions about African economic transformation and what we need to do and so on and so forth. And they got to Kigami. And he said, you know something? Everybody keeps asking me how Rwanda is doing what it's doing and you know, how, how is it that you know, you've, you've been... Rwanda has stopped talking. We know what to do. Look, in the, look around this room. We're preaching to the choir in this room. Where are the bank CEOs? They sent their sustainability people to come and come and listen to something they already know. Right? Where are the CEOs? They are too important. Dealing, they're dealing with risk. <laughs> to come and talk about gender. Do you see what I mean? So let's stop talking. Let's do. That's my final comment. Just do it. We know what to do. So let's just do it. John? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, one key thing, uh, a, a key word from this forum, as I have come to see, is uh, being intentional, like intentional and deliberate about our journey and where we want to get to. I'm not a very good friend of mandating and compelling, but I'm a friend of setting measurable targets that you can follow and get things you know, uh, done in, in, in that direction. I don't want us to have 40% of women in the boardroom because people said we should lift women to the boardroom and people begin questioning how they got to the boardroom and what they say becomes something that does not matter. I want it to be that we have a program that migrates a lot of women to the boardroom on the basis of merit and competence and ability to deliver to the organization objectives. And that when she stands up to speak, the room is quiet because everybody is listening. And that journey starts with us. And I like the point you made about uh, speaking to the, or preaching to the choir. I think this, this discussion should not end here. As banks, um, um, even in our magazine, annual magazine that we, we issue as an association, one of the key things that we measure, we call the non-financial indicators, 
uh, we talk, we look critically and delve deeper into gender issues. Um, perhaps we shouldn't even call it non-financial because it is actually financial. We are in the business of risk management. And as I said before, risk is best managed when we see it from all the angles. Things that a junior staff may see, you who calls yourself the executive, you may have no sight of because the angle of processing is very different. So something that a woman may see, you can sit there and have all the degrees and all the years behind you, and it, you miss it gigantically, but she may see it just on point because of her background and where she's coming from. So we have a duty as an industry to make this work, and again, talk is cheap. We need to get to the business of measuring the talk. And when we start counting, that we begin seeing whether we are making some, some progress. Um, as an association, I'm taking a very big cue from here, whether perhaps even publication of um, uh, equality Olympics for the banks, so that we know banks that are doing very well in this area, maybe have a greater number of females in their supervisory to managerial level, and then there will be the layer that is moving into the executive and to the, onto the board. And we can use those kind of mechanisms to push those who are lagging to also, you know, pick up the books and do that which is right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would um, start by acknowledging the, the opportunity to have this conversation. Because if we think we are in a, a place where we have a lot to do, it means we can't stop talking about, about it. Do, we, do I believe that we've come far, as a bank, as especially in the banking industry? Yes. Um, we've come very, very far. In my 20 more years in banking, I sit here and I think uh, it's okay to talk about the fact that we've made a lot of progress. But banking industry is also the most progressive um, industry, the financial industry in the world. And it's changing so fast that I believe things like what we're discussing, gender, leadership at the top, seat at the table, should also go at the same pace at which the industry is changing. And that is why the migration point that you made is very important that looking at what we have, we need to be very, very intentional. Measure not in bulk, like, because if you want to know how many women are in the banking sector, we have a lot more women in the banking sector. But the more you bring it to the top, or the apex of the pyramid, that's where we know we have a problem. And so for me, that is how we're even going to measure and how we're going to call out those who are not meeting these standards, very important. Doing also means holding people accountable. And I think the accountability um, measures that we put in place should also be stringent. And um, institutions like PwC can hold the banking institutions accountable in ensuring that the things that our governance structures provide that we do we are really doing it, and we can have that, we can see that impact being made in the banking sector. So for me, let's hold the banking sector accountable. Let's measure the right things and see the change. And let's grow and move at the same pace as the industry is changing. Thank you. Thank you. So. Cynthia Fawson, Carbag board member, John Ewa, CEO, GAB, and Pearl Nkrumah, Executive Director, Access Bank. Thank you very much for making the time. I think it's, it's clear to all of us, right, that the environment we even live in is already by us. So when organizations are taking steps, we have to be deliberate, no box ticking. And also as leaders in those organizations as well, we have to be very intentional 
about the initiatives we take. Thank you very much, and thank you for spending this time with us. Like I say, when the conversation is sweet, sometimes you lose track of time. So thank you for the extra time you gave me. I didn't ask for it, though, but thank you for giving it to me anyway. So quickly, we've come to the end of the program, and um, I'd like to invite the country senior partner of PwC right here in Ghana, Vish Ashabo, to share a few thoughts and give us the closing remarks. Vish is here. Please help me welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeej, thank you very much for moderating uh, an excellent discussion and uh, sincere thanks to the panel members. I think that we've We've had a fruitful session, but in actual fact, it seems to me that we just scratched the surface uh, of, the, of the topic at hand. Um, for us as PwC, uh, one may ask why we got involved in this, and I think Clara explained right at the beginning of the session why we thought it to be important. Uh, in closing, what I'll say is that I agree with the sentiments expressed by the panel that um, this is not or should not be a tick box exercise. Uh, it's actually a business issue, right? Um, because the, the stakeholders that we serve are diverse. So if you are in a, in a service industry, in this case banking, and you are seeking to serve as wide a stakeholder group as possible, obviously you need to understand them and be able to tailor your products, your services to their needs. So for us, it's a, it's a business issue that we see, uh, and we believe that the whole discussion about diversity, in this case gender, but as Clara said at the beginning, there are other uh, elements of diversity that we should and will consider in due course, are very important. And today we're talking about banking, but actually the same could be said uh, for, for other industries and other sectors. So um, it's my great pleasure to thank you all for being part of this session. Uh, for, for the panel members particularly, we thank you for your insights. I think we go away from here uh, with perhaps a better understanding of the issues at hand. We may not have all the solutions today, but it's something that we'll keep working on uh, as we go forward. Um, just before I, uh, I finally close the, the, the session, uh, on a lighter note, I was reflecting on uh, what was said, and in particular what uh, Dr. Forson said about uh, men making all the important decisions like uh, uh, going to war and, uh, and all of that. And, uh, and also the discussion about uh, what we used to call imposter syndrome, which we will not refer to anymore after today. Um, the truth of the matter is, and I think we know, but we don't say it. The truth of the matter is, as a man, when you have an important or difficult decision to make, normally you are very uncomfortable about it. And the minute you make that decision, or at the point where you make that decision, it's normally because there's a woman somewhere who has pushed you and put you under incessant pressure uh, to, to make the move uh, and to make the decision. Right. So um, the issue about uh, Doc, the issue about men deciding to go to war. Uh, I think if you look carefully, um, <laughs> I'm old enough to remember uh, when Britain went to war against Argentina in the 80s, and it was a prime minister called Margaret Thatcher who eventually, <laughs> who eventually took that decision. Uh, and then when uh, the U.S. took on Iraq, I think there was also a lady national security advisor who pushed President Bush uh, to finally take that decision. So all I'm saying is that uh, we recognize uh, that the ladies can also take important decisions and we encourage everybody uh, to enable that diverse uh, environment so that together we can move forward as businesses and society as general. So thank you all for your participation and we look forward to interacting with you further. Thank you. So thank you very much, Vish. And um, that, that was quite interesting. I, I admire the observations. So breakfast is still served, especially for those of us who like to have late breakfast. And please let the conversation continue. Like uh, Cynthia said, let's do, right? <laughs> let's not just be talking about it. Let's do, right? Thank you very much, and thank you for making time to join us today.